So, Romans chapter 6 this morning. Romans chapter 6. So, you guys will find a, a familiar pattern here. Um, as we teach through the Word of God, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and looking for the Lord to speak through and to teach us through His Word. Um, as we'll find today, if we were left to ourselves, um, <laughs> it wouldn't be very good. <sighs> Romans chapter 6, as we close the door on Romans chapter 5, we saw that sin and death... Um, for those in Christ, no longer is the ruling force anymore. But that grace might super abundantly abound towards us. Because in Adam, all died. And we, kinda, we looked at that, that when the first man, Adam, sinned, that death spread to the billions. Everybody has died. One to one ratio. But that all in Christ, in the same way that he was that, that figurehead, that federal head, for all of us, that all in Christ might also be made alive. Because as sin spread from Adam and that died, it also, we also became all sinners. That all we like sheep have gone astray and each one has gone our own way. And sin began to stack up as there became millions to billions of sinful people. And it stacked up faster than the U.S. dead over the last 10 years. But God said, take a look at all of that and take a look at all the world. Now you have an understanding that all of that is nothing compared to the grace that I extend to you. That where sin abounded throughout the entire world, throughout all history, my grace is greater. That his grace is greater. And so, as we progress through the book of Romans and we first looked at sin, the fact that we were all bankrupt before God, and then we went into salvation that we are saved by grace through faith and that we are justified, made just as we had never sinned and God giving us Jesus' righteousness through faith in him, purchased by his shed blood. And he gives us that foundation because as we transition into Romans 6, we are going to touch on something that gets close to human nature and that's um, going to work. Galatians, the church that was in the region of Galatia, they began in the Spirit, started off with the gospel of grace, but pretty soon came, someone came by and said, hey, did you know you also need to be circumcised? Hey, did you know you also got to do this? And they began to perfect themselves in the flesh. And as if you look at all the religious systems throughout the world, it is what appeals to us is that we want something to do with our salvation. We want to get right with God out of our own strength. And so as we go into Romans 6, the Lord lays this beautiful foundation in 4 and 5 that it's not about us. It is about Him and what He has done. So we want to make sure that we flavor that to look at the broader context as we come into the chapter 6 because it's really easy to look at some of these verses and say, man, I need to get myself right but we need to, as uh, a friend of mine once taught, we need to battle and we need to approach this from victory, not to victory. The victory is already won in Christ. So as we move forward in chapter 6, we want to keep that in mind. We're going to deal with, in chapter 6, 7, and 8, the process of sanctification. Okay, we worked out sin, salvation, and now we're going to work into sanctification. Put simply, it's basically to take something and we're going to set it apart. Now, the Lord may have been, you know, they say in the Old Testament with the tabernacle, someone may have given like a, a bronze water pot. And for all your life, it may have just simply been a bronze water pot. But then when it was sanctified for the service of the Lord, it became something that was special and used for the Lord. And God's going to teach us how to do that with our lives to take it and to set it apart as holy for the Lord. The gospel's way of living a holy life. But not just holy in righteousness, but holy. 
completely with your entire life, <clears throat> given and separated, living for Jesus Christ. It's one that is not lived for oneself, but we take up the mantle that's been set before us, the baton, if you will, of those who've gone before us and has been set forth by the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 John 3.16, it says that the Lord laid his life down for us and that we might also lay down our lives for the brethren. And it's not speaking simply of Jesus willing to, to die and give his life for us, but that when he came, he lived his life for us. He became the servant of all as a model for us to go and that our life would be a, a life of service. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, it says that the love of Christ compels us. And we judge this, that if one died for all, then all died. And that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again. So as we get into this process of sanctification, it is a life given wholly to the Lord. And if we love the Lord, it's a guarantee that we'll love those around us as we walk this out. In these chapters 6 and 8, chapter 6, we're going to see how to live a victorious Christian life. In chapter 7, we're going to get into liberty. And in chapter 8, security. All of these things in, in living our life for Jesus Christ. Because as we give up our desires, we give up, we lay down our life to not only call him Savior, but to call him Lord. We must look again at the character of the one who, while we were sinners, died for us. The one that gave us grace upon grace. The one that, when we turn and believed in him, freely gave us all things. So as we commit our lives into his hands, and we look at the choice by the end of this chapter, may we do so with a with a cheerful heart. God loves a cheerful giver. I want to flavor this one with one more verse. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 30. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Now, oftentimes, I'll take a little bit more time. A lot of, I used to really mark my Bible when I was going to flip there. But I don't do that anymore so that uh, I try not to get ahead of you guys in case you turn there. <clears throat> Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. All of our lives we are subject under bondage, laboring, working, servants of sin. And Jesus gave us that call to come to him, turn to him, and he will give us rest for our souls. But he also says, take my yoke upon you, which is an instrument of work, of labor. But he says in that, that he's gentle, lowly of heart. And even in that, you will find rest. So as we in, engage in Romans 6, and we get into this, this difficult and deep chapter, let us remember the heart of the Lord from chapter 4, chapter 5. That one that says as you come to him and as you put on that yoke and you go to work, it's easy. It should be light because you're walking with him. And we know that that's not burdensome. Chapter 6, verse 1. Paul is going to deal with, after dealing with the positional, how we do positionally, he's going to transition. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So he poses a question. He's been dealing with, with sins and how we are, we relate to God positionally. That as we placed our faith in Jesus Christ, we are now saved and sealed in him. And so, for as his grace has super abundantly abounded over all sin of all time, there was no limit. We didn't say, oh, well, there was, 
six million people in the kingdom now, God doesn't have grace for any more. But that he has grace for enough for everyone. Has enough grace for you and all that's in your life. And so they, he anticipates this question, well, you know, if I could live that way and God's glorified with all this grace and how good he is over my rottenness, well, can I just keep walking in that? And Paul will frequently say, certainly not. Or in the old King James, God forbid we should continue to walk in that. Um, he, uh, Paul is pretty, pretty serious when it comes to this, knowing the grace of God, but he's serious about this. There, in the 1800s, there was a Hungarian physician. He came to be known as the savior of mothers. Before this time, no one had really ever washed their hands in delivering babies. Now, in, in the midwives, where midwives would give birth, it was in the teens percentage of, of who would die when they'd go to give birth birth. Um, so 15 out of 100 or so moms would die while giving childbirth. Where the doctors were laboring, it was closer to 40% of moms that walked in there would die from giving birth, uh, partially because the doctors dealt with a wider range of um, patients. And so they would be dealing with someone on their deathbed or this sickness or that sickness, and then they'd walk right in and deliver a baby and the moms would get sick. And so this guy, um, he began to simply wash his hands. And it, it was actually with a chlorine and lime solution, but by the time he really implemented this in their facility, the death rate fell to less than 1%. He was ridiculed for a long time because he had no scientific proof for why it worked. They hadn't yet discovered bacteria and a lot of the diseases and issues and why, why they were passed on. He was later thrown into a, a mental facility and beaten to death a couple weeks later. But he had discovered something that was contributing to the death of thousands, and he made a change. I mean, God lined this out for the scriptures and, and the law a long time before modern medicine ever figured it out. But he discovered it, and he made a change, and he stood by it. Paul is going to lay out for us a case that there's this blessing of that cleansing, of, of changing our practice of what we do. Verse 3, Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into Jesus' death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likenesses of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Here in the next 10 or so verses, we're going to deal with... Um, kind of a progression of how to work this out. And first in verse 3 and in verse 6, he says, no, and knowing this, that we are going to start with the, the understanding of where we are and what has occurred, what is a spiritual truth for us. And then in verse 11, we're going to reckon it. We're going to what it is, it's, it's a logical, it's a, like a mathematical accounting. We're going to actually sit down and think about it. And then in verse 13, we're going to begin to present or to yield ourselves to what is right. So here in verse 3 through 5, we have a couple things going on. And if you only understood water baptism from this, you'd come up a little bit short in your understanding. There's a couple things going on here. Um, one, and first and primarily, when you received Jesus Christ, you are now in him. And here in verse 3 it says, you were baptized into his death. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So not only was Christ our substitute, 
our substitution, but in him we also died. In verse 4, that we are buried with him in baptism unto death, that just as in Christ we are raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so that we should walk in the newness of life. So spiritually, first and foremost, we died in Christ, but just as he was risen, so now we are. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, it speaks of this, that we set our minds on the things above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. And then it goes on to say that, I better read it, better read it. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Christ, that resurrection, that raised with Christ, seek those things or set your affections on the things above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of earth. For or because you died and your life is hidden in Christ and God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. This process of you died... And Paul's really going to want us to understand this, that in him you died, but you have also been raised to life. And this is where we get that understanding, this, this teaching of the resurrected life, which is sometimes gets a little bit complicated, oftentimes by ourselves. But he wants us to understand this principle, that we are united together, we are placed in Christ in death, and we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So, oftentimes, um, this is a, a good understanding for why, why when we baptize someone, we, we place them all the way under the water. Um, this, when we are baptized and we have that conviction, not for salvation, but to display what God has done spiritually, that with Christ, me, the old me, has died. And when you bring back up in the water, it is symbolic of that resurrection, that new life. As Kelly put on the front of your bulletins, Colossians, sorry, Colossians, Galatians 2.20, for I am crucified with Christ, that, that death with him, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So as he gets this process of sanctification rolling in our life, he wants you to understand that we are supposed to leave our old self behind. When we actually live out and think these words, I gave my life to Jesus. It's not mine anymore. It's that same principle. We, we died. And we shall be raised in his likeness of his resurrection. John Corson shares uh, something that occurred, I believe it was in Desert Storm, as all the troops were going in there before they were going to invade. Um, hundreds of them decided to get right with God, give their life to Jesus Christ. And so they wanted to get baptized, and so they didn't have any water necessarily around. So they wound up taking a coffin and filling it with water, and they were doing baptisms that way. <laughs> which, which, you know, I mean, we could do here. Probably not the best church growth program. <laughs> or have it out front, a little baptismal tank, or up here, you know, what a coffin doing. But, but that idea that in, buried with him in baptism and raised to new life. The old James is gone. The old man is done. He's dead. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in Christ. Christ in me, if you will. Um, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So Paul will elaborate a little bit more on this in chapter 7, but you know, you're only bound under the law for righteousness for as long as you're alive. But in Christ we have died, and if you have died to sin, you are no longer slaves of sin. If you have given your life to Christ, you are free from the bondage of sin and death. The enemy 
What was his power? The fear of death. The wages of sin is death. But those who are in Christ are no longer under that anymore. But it says the old man was crucified, annulled, rendered powerless. I kind of like the idea of paralyzed a little bit because it doesn't say that the old man was annihilated. Because sometimes, as we're going to see as we walk through this, sometimes we like to go over and grab that old man and, and put him back to work as, as we still um, carry and battle against the flesh. When we battle against that sin nature, still um, resembling the image of Adam, if you will, uh, waiting for that day when we get to go home and be with the Lord and put all these things off. Um, as we battle... Sometimes we like to put that old man back, back in, back and going. But Paul's going to lay out a case that we would understand and know positionally first that you have died and you are free from sin and that with him you were also raised to new life. I want you to know this, Paul says. I want you to know it. Understand with your mind, or with your heart, and then yield it in your life. And he's going to build, begin to build this case. So he first builds it um, with the spiritual fact that this, this has occurred. The old man is crucified, done away with. And verse 7, he who has died is freed from sin. Now in chapter 5, it spoke a lot of our sins and how they were forgiven. Now he's going to deal with the topic of sin. Not particular, in particular sin, but sin as a whole. Because as we are free, he also wants us to know that we are free from sin, not free to sin. And much difference. We are, as the Lord says, we are to be holy. Because I, the Lord, am holy. That's what he, what he told. He wants us to be his beautiful bride. That life that is free and victorious in him. Verse 8, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. So this resurrected life. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, Paul realizing that his whole life, according to the flesh, was great. But he, but he comes to this realization. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I have counted all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul said all that stuff, man, I was born to the right family. I did all the right things. No one could blame me for anything. On the outside, I was blameless. And all of these things being, you know, above all my peers, I counted it all as rubbish that I may gain Christ, that I may know the power of his resurrection. And he's laying out this case for us. Look, you on yourself, we dealt with that in chapter 2 and chapter 3. You were bankrupt. You didn't have anything to bring to the game. But that you would say, man, I count that as loss, that I may gain the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, that I may know the power of his resurrection. And to do that, we, we have to die. We have to die to ourselves. We have to let that old man be crucified. And as I was sharing with the base camp college group on Thursday nights, um, we were going through Mark chapter 8 and dealing with um, taking up your cross, denying yourself, and following him. And as I switched to Romans, I really saw a neat parallel that I really hadn't drawn before. In the Gospel of John, or in the early chapters, Paul, or sorry, Paul, I'm so used to saying Paul. John shares with us that when they first came to Jesus, many of them already believed that he was the Christ. You can read it in John chapter 1. Uh, um, 
with Nathaniel comes, when, when Peter comes, they already, many of them already believed that he was the Son of God, the Messiah. But in John chapter 8, Jesus asks, or Mark chapter 8, Jesus asks them, who do men say that I am? And they give their answers all across the board. And then he says, but who do you say that I am? You as a group. They said, well, you're, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, right on, Peter. Peter, always quick to speak up. And it was interesting to me, why ask that question again? You know, Peter, it's clear that him and his brother uh, already knew that, already believed this. Why ask them again? It was because he was bringing them to a deeper relationship, a stronger walk with him. Because he, they had walked with him now for a couple years and seen miracles and his grace and got to know who he was. And just like in Babes in Christ, he gives us such great grace. And we'll have that time where we just walk with him and we get to know him. And it's just sweet because he just says, come here and I love you. Just like many of your moms can relate when you get that baby. They haven't done anything for you. Maybe even against you so far. No sleep. Pregnant. But you just love them. And when we start off with Christ, I think it's a lot like that. We're some knuckleheads. But he just loves you. But as you grow... He asks you, what, son, you know, what are you going to do with your life? And you dream, you talk, and pretty soon, what are you going to do with your life? <laughs> Some of us, pretty soon, why haven't you done anything with your life? <laughs> but he was calling them to that deeper, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And so as he began in, in Mark 8, he continued after saying, who do you say that I am? Well, you're the Christ. He began to openly share that he was going to die and suffer and be crucified. And Peter Pulls him aside and is going to rebuke him for saying these things. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, because you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. See, Peter had a plan. They had a plan. They had what Peter's will was. They brought all that stuff to the table, and they weren't mindful of what God's plans were. And if they could see it from the, that perspective, from God's perspective, he would have said, man, Jesus, I can't wait for you to go to the cross because you're going to save me. But he thought he had a whole different plan of, of how they were going to rule and reign with Jesus and wipe out Rome and so on and so forth. But he wasn't mindful of the things of God, but the things, his plans. And then Jesus walks from that into verse 34 of Mark chapter 8, where he says, And then he called the people to himself with his disciples. He said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. So he begins to work out this interesting principle that that walk forward with you has, has nothing to do with you. Luke says that we should take up that cross daily. Now, as we think about this old man dying is taking up this cross, what was the cross to them? Jesus hadn't gone to it yet. It wasn't some endure, you know, endearing thing or some cool idea or something that you'd put on a necklace. You know, you'd have to walk by someone going in town. The Roman government would put them up there and crucify them so they'd be naked and screaming and dying. So you, as you walked into town, you'd know you don't want to do what that guy did. Jesus said, take that old man. Let him die. Daily, let him die. Take up your cross and follow him. Live that life that, that didn't, it's an end on the cross, but that resurrection and follow him as he made that way. To be able to wake up that morning and say, God, these are, these are your kids. You know, I've, I mess things up a lot. Help me to do it your way today. Let the old man die. How can I live for you? God, this phone. And I know how the old man would use it. Help me to use it for your glory. My life, my husband or wife, my family, my grandchildren, my job, my recreation, the 4th of July. Lord, help me to live that life that's now to you. I take up that cross. Understand that the old man, he was nailed and he died. And now let me follow you. He's going to, kind of tell us how that works itself out here. Back in Romans chapter 6. 
verse 10. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. That is after reckoning that old man dead, we are now to transition that following Christ is that life that is lived for him and to him. As, again, Galatians 2.20, that, that life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That life lived to God, understanding that the old James, he's done. He's done. Verse 11, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey its lusts. So here we have another piece that Paul stacks on. First, no. Know that positionally, the old man's dead, you're alive, no longer under the reign of terror and sin in your life. You are alive in Christ Jesus, and that we should no longer live under the obedience or live that life commanded by sin, by the old man. And he says reckon. Again, it's basically that word impute that we talked about. It's that um, calculation, that logical thinking out, that understanding of the position. So now that we've got the spiritual truth, I want to understand that this should be a reality in my life, to reckon it, to work it out so that I should no longer walk in sin to let it reign in our mold of body. So one guy literally translated it this way, do not always always letting sin reign in your body that you should obey its lusts. We got, a new, we got a new boss in town and it's no longer sin. Know it that it's a spiritual fact for those who have given their lives to Jesus Christ. Now understand that as we grow, as we mature, as we're no longer babes in Christ, we're called to that point where Jesus has been walking for us for a while, and he says, who do you say I am? And you say, ah, oh, you're, you're my Lord and Savior. Amen. Now it's time to start walking. Grab the cross, realize the old man is dead, and follow me, that life lived to God, that sanctified life living in the power and newness of the resurrection. Letting the old things pass away. All things have become new. Verse 13. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So as I read earlier, this pursuit, this passionate walk towards Christ is not, does not mean that we are perfected. Paul said, look, not that I'm already perfected, but I press on. And we say, you know, scoot over Paul, I hope there's room, because we ain't perfect yet either. But understanding that we want to present, knowing who we are in Christ, knowing what he's called us to do, we want to present ourselves as instruments. In Corinthians, the same Greek word is used as weapons. Instruments or weapons of righteousness. In verse 13, instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So, maybe a good measuring stick for some of you, and I know it is for me. Am I as good a saint as I was a sinner? Am I as passionate about the things of the Lord as I was of the things of the world? Is the James that died, and the James that's alive, living for Christ, living, offering himself up as an instrument of righteousness as much as he did as an instrument of unrighteousness? Um, I'm not too sure about that because I was pretty, pretty passionate about unrighteousness for a long time. Um, but it's a good measuring stick. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are under, not under law, but under grace. So Paul gives us that dose of grace there as, as we get this 
urge to, what are you going to do with your life, son? To not make it about ourselves. Look, it's really easy to now implement that, that nature that we have that wants to be that worker that gets wages, that God now owes us something because now we're, we're in the game. But to remember that we're under grace, we're saved by grace, and we're a bunch of sinners, knuckleheads, that still need it. We should no longer let sin dominate and rule our life because we have been freed, the old man is dead. But the fact is that you will, you will still sin. And praise God, as he brings out, that when we do, we don't have to get resaved. We simply have to confess our sin, and He is just, faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all of our sins. His grace hasn't ran out. It's not getting close to being short. Better hurry up. Well, you better hurry up because He's coming. But, but it's not because He's almost out of grace that we are not under law but under grace to present our bodies that way. Now, there's a. Uh, a word, present. It's going to occur five times over, by the end of the next chapter. And we're not going to present our bodies to sin, but to God. And we're going to not only know these things, but we're going to reckon them, we're going to calculate it out. And then the conclusion is, by the end, that we present or yield our bodies in the service of the Lord. So, 15 through the rest of 23 is going to be kind of the, kind of the why. Why? Um, you know, I understand and know God's word, but do I believe it? As we read these things, he's coming to the conclusion that do we believe this enough to walk it out? Yeah, I understand that we're saved. Old man's dead. I should live in the newness of life. But to let it fully have its work in our life, to know it, to reckon it, and then to present ourselves with all of our heart, mind, and strength. See, we're called to worship, we're called to prayer, fruit-bearing, holiness, because the Lord is. Verse 15. What shall we say then, or what then shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Again, the freedom from sin, not the freedom to sin. Because as we look at presenting ourselves as the instrument of righteousness, here we see that Paul reminded us that we are under grace, not under law. But that that should not prevent us from living out our life for Jesus Christ. It's that process of working out our salvation, not working for our salvation. And they're quite, quite different and so, should we live, continue to live that way because we're not under law? The freedom. So, Paul and the church today, really still, comes under attack quite often when the gospel of grace is preached. Because, from a fleshly, from a worldly perspective, who, in their mind, would work harder or do all of this if they didn't have to? If there wasn't that, if you don't keep the Sabbath, you'll die. If you, if you commit adultery, you'll be stoned. If they don't have that, if you're just under grace and you get to choose, who would do it? Wouldn't we just continue on, under, continue on sinning now that we're free? Not bound by the law? Shouldn't we do that? Paul says, certainly not. Certainly not. And he's going to lay out kind of a case on why. Verse 16, do you know, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves, whom you obey, whether sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Wholeheartedly believed the teaching the doctrine, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they were set free. And they looked back at Adam and said, yeah, you know, Adam sinned, and he became a slave. 
We sinned. We became slaves to sin. That was our life before Jesus Christ. That was our life before he set us free is that we were slaves to sin and death, being under the fear of death. But eternal life in Jesus Christ, his sacrifice has set us free. And so he says, um, he's reminding us of that before he builds into his closing argument on the subject. In verse 18, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because the weakness of your flesh, for just as you were presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So because you have been set free, do this. I quoted it earlier, but I want to go back and read this. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'll read verses 14 and 15. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. He's laying out this case that you were slaves of sin, under fear of death, aliens from the promises of God, without God and without hope. And then he set you free, gave you a future and a hope, planned works for your life from the foundations of the world that you might walk in them, that he might bless you and be with you and one day raise you up and set you up as a beautiful jewel being set free from sin. He said, you should become slaves of righteousness, knowing the, knowing the character and the love of the Father of whom you're, you're placing your life into, his hands. So because of that, the love of Christ compels us. It's our motivating factor. Our motivating factor isn't that sin is bad, The wages of sin is death. A motivating factor is no longer those things. That was those who were motivated by fear of the law. Our motivation is the goodness and the grace of God, the love of God that's been poured out into our hearts abundantly is now the factor why we do things. And so as he's giving this exhortation for us to have that life that is set apart holy and holy to the Lord, He said, why you do it is so important. It's because the love of Christ compels us. Verse 20. For when we were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and becoming slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness And the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So we have the end of this is life in its fullness. We have the down payment. We have been made new in Christ, but it ain't over yet. Soon he will come and we will be with him. And life in all its fullness as we are given a new body as we dwell in heaven with him, and he blesses us for those things which we have done. Life in its fullness. It says in 21, what fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. And he closes in, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we often share that verse with people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. But here he uses it to compel those who do. And again, as we learned, and I love the fact that Paul set up the foundation in 4 and 5, that we are secure in Christ. But what he's doing here is setting out, just like with that that doctor, you want to go back to not washing your hands when death reigned and these moms give them delivery? You want to go back to that? That was the fruit. That's what you want to serve? Death? Death? that things that you were ashamed of, all those things that your life produced when James was in charge, that's really how you want to walk your days out with the Lord? 
the old man in charge. That was death. But if we live that life that now where we live in faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us, it's eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's a couple options of what we serve and what we labor in in, in here. One that produces wages or one that's a free gift. One that is, uh, produces death and one eternal life. Sin or God. I want to close with 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. See, because, and I don't know, I hope that the Lord spoke through it all. Um, Romans 6 is such a call to take up your cross, such a call to live that sanctified life. But it also, in the midst of it, is a call to do it because, because God's that good. The old life and the old fruit is that bad. Why would you therefore put yourself as a weapon or an instrument to continue on in those things? Reckon the old man dead and present yourself, yield yourself to that life in Christ that as he rose to live that life to God, so we shall also. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. For I am already poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me also, to me only, but also to those who have loved his appearing. We want to be that person. I want to invite the worship crew to maybe come back up. We want to be that, that people that live that holy life, completely given to him, not trying to resurrect that old man, but to, to reckon, to judge him as dead, that we might live holy to God in that life, that victorious Christian life over sin, over this world, that we, that we please him because we love him. And not only that, because he first loved us, and as Romans 12 will say, it's our reasonable service. You know, it's, the, it's the least we could do. So Father, kind of a, a heavy chapter. But Lord, I see your grace all over in it. You had given these Roman Christians time to grow in you, to get to know you. You have taught them about your grace, your unmeasurable grace and how secure they were in you. And as they grew up a little, you said, okay, now it's time, it's time to walk with me. Not just to sit by me to believe me, but to walk with me, to live that life set apart wholly to God. Lord, as we walk through this, Lord, may we remember the character and the nature of the one who calls us. God, you're good. And you are worth trusting with our whole life. We've seen what we can do. Shame, sin. We kind of goof everything up, Lord, because we're, we're boneheads. But God, we ask that you would give us the strength to fully surrender, to mentally understand and to walk out that the old, the old James, the old man is gone. And that there is a glorious, victorious life sitting in front of us and that if we will yield to it and walk in the newness of life, where there is no condemnation in Christ, a life lived by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen.